The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to today's webinar, Positive Approaches to Discipline. This webinar is presented by Jewish Family and Children's Service, Parents in a Pinch, and Magic Dean. Jewish Family and Children's Service is Boston's leading and trusted provider of comprehensive human services. Parents in a Pinch is an award-winning backup care and nanny placement company that provides a safety net for working parents whenever gaps in their child care or elder care arrangements occur. Magic Beans is a toy store with more than five locations in the Boston area that caters to the needs of infants, toddlers, children, and their parents. I am happy to be here today with our presenter, Karen Lowey. Hi, I'm a clinical social worker with a psychotherapy practice in Lexington, Massachusetts. I like to focus with uh, my clients on the transition to parenthood and also other family and children's issues. And my name is Jennifer Meyerhart. I work at Jewish Family and Children's Services with families and their young children, focusing specifically on working with families whose children are at risk for developmental and social obstacles. We will now begin our webinar. The topics will be presented through slides. This webinar can only be heard through your phone. All attendees' voices will be muted. Questions can be submitted in the dialog box and will either be answered individually via email or addressed at the end of the session by myself and by Karen. Thank you, Jennifer. Today we're going to be talking about positive approaches to discipline. We'll talk about child behavior and development, the differences between punishment and discipline, and also how to foster internal growth and positive qualities in your child. If you're participating today, you're probably familiar with the idea that parenting is an adventure. It can be confusing to understand children's behavior and what's appropriate for different ages and also how to respond effectively so that it feels like you're making progress. Our first poll question is now coming up on your screen. Have you ever noticed your children act differently before mastering a new skill? We'll wait a few moments while everyone answers, and then I will share the results. Karen, you'll be interested to notice that about a third of our participants do notice that their children act differently before mastering a new skill, and about two-thirds have not noticed that. That is interesting. Let's take a closer look at how children develop. Children have a really big job. Actually, it's a lot of jobs. They're developing in multiple domains, speech, motor, regulatory, social and emotional skills, and cognitive development all at the same time. They are the original multitaskers, and I'm not sure that they're any more perfect at it than the rest of us. Uh, it's important to know that the development happens in a nonlinear way. It's not in a straight line. Children will take a few steps forward in development, maybe learning how to speak, for instance, and then take a step backward. Uh, have a, a regression, and that's completely typical. Sometimes that regression is even in a different area. When that's happening, you might notice that if you look at the bottom of the slide, um, there's a child who's beginning to walk, and apparently he's having some tantrums. You might wonder why, or his parent seems to be, um, and he's thinking, it's because I'm busy learning to walk. So things can get 
uh, disrupted in various areas. Uh, and it, it can be a little bit hard to know what's causing some of the behaviors. Uh, it can be frustrating for a child mastering a new skill. Um, you might see that frustration as irritability or sleep, um, sleep issues or problems, tantrums, a, a number of different things might show up. And that's completely typical. It's important to know that um, sometimes this, this regression occurs right before a burst in development. So if you can take a step back and watch your child's development, see if, uh, if it goes away, the, the problem behavior goes away, and if there is a mastering of a new skill. Uh, it might be comforting to see that. It's also particularly important to know um, what stage of development is happening for your child. Uh, you'll have different expectations and notice different things for a two-year-old than a four-year-old. Even if you have twins, children develop individually in a different, at a different pace. So it helps to know your own child. Let's talk about some common challenging behaviors. These are the behaviors that make us want to pull our hair out or count the minutes until bedtime. And I think we've probably all been there as parents. You may have seen some or perhaps all of these behaviors at different times. Things like hitting and pushing, tantrums, lying, whining, that's a big one, bickering, particularly if they're siblings, testing limits, a lot of saying no, throwing food perhaps, refusing things, like refusing to stay in a room or a timeout, um, refusing to go to school on a given morning, fresh talk or destroying property. These are all pretty universal behaviors that children show at one time or another. The best thing to do is to start by thinking, what is the meaning behind the behavior? Ask yourself, what is my child trying to tell me? There are various reasons that children behave in a certain way, and it's crucial to observe your child there are some different ways that children will misbehave as a way to, to tell you something about what's going on. Uh, one might be that natural regression phase that we talked about before. But other types of more clear uh, statements of meaning could be things like a need for attention. Or maybe a child is so angry or frustrated but doesn't have the words to express it. A common reason for acting out is if there's been a recent stressor or change in the family. Uh, typical ones would be a move, a recent move, or a recent, um, perhaps a new sibling has come home, um, uh, was born. Maybe there's a new school that your child has started, or a new caregiver. Any of these recent stressors or changes uh, can really be disruptive and cause a child to, to just feel out of balance and act out. And another reason might be curiosity. As children develop a sense of autonomy and wanting a sense of agency, really, they want to know, what can I cause to happen around me? If I yell really loud, will mom and dad come running? Or if I, what will happen if I push over the salt shaker? So any of those things might be um, some ideas for statements that, um, that your child is trying to communicate. It helps to observe what's going on. So think of yourself as a scientist. If you take a step back and look at the behavior, think about maybe what happened right beforehand. What was the precursor? Uh, does the behavior that, that seems to be a problem, does it happen at a certain time of day? Uh, maybe in a certain setting. Is it a, at preschool or at home? Um, is it when your child seems hungry? Or perhaps in a very stimulating environment? Behaviors usually don't happen in a vacuum. So if you can figure out what might be causing some of these behaviors, one way to help it is to address the underlying cause. There are often logical reasons for the acting out. When we recognize that the problem behaviors are often normal, um, that can be very reassuring. Yes, we still have to address the behaviors, but hopefully we can do it with a calmer outlook and in a more matter-of-fact way. It puts it in perspective. Uh, we don't panic and wonder, what's the matter with my child? Or what's going to happen in the future? And we don't take it so personally. Why is she doing that to me? So those types of things can be very reassuring and help us proceed with a level head. 
Sometimes, though, it might not be clear. If you're uncertain about why a behavior is happening, you still can't figure it out, um, there isn't a clear reason, or it's persisting for a long time, at that point, it might be helpful to have some sort of individual professional consultation to get a few ideas of how to address it. Karen, a lot of the families I work with, they have their own histories they come with, and so certain behaviors are real, really triggers for them. How do you um, address that? Well, that's a, a really good question, Jennifer. Uh, as parents, we often bring our own baggage with us. I would, I would kind of characterize it as uh, we all grew up in a certain environment, and certain patterns have been what we learned. As adults now, as, as when we become parents, things can trigger us more than it might trigger someone else. And at those times, it's really helpful to become aware of that. How, you know, how is the person, um, you know, how was I raised? What comes automatically to me as a, as a response or as a reaction? And if it's not something that I feel very good about, maybe I would like to improve that reaction, that's a, that's a sign that maybe I should take a step back count to 10, remember, that's a trigger for me because of how I was raised, and then proceed. So how or when should we respond to problem behaviors? The first step is to think about what kind of person you would like your child to grow up to be. There may be, it, you may not have thought of this before if your children are young, but it's a very important thing to think of, to put a framework on how we should respond to different behaviors. You can take a moment now and think about what are some of the qualities that are important for us to teach our children. The ones um, that we've listed here uh, may be some of the ones that come to mind, things like responsibility, good judgment or impulse control, kindness, self-confidence, or honesty. There may be others that you come up with that are particularly important to you. The reason that it's important to focus on this now is because it helps to think of the long-term issues rather than just the short-term answers of responding to behavior. So maybe you don't know whether to address uh, if your child is breaking his sister's toy, or if he's also drawing on a book page. But if you put it in, in more of a, a framework of long-term qualities, you might think, hmm, it's important for him to learn how to share or get along or tolerate jealousy. So I think that I'm going to address that um, he shouldn't break his sister's toy, because in time, that will be what I can tie into other teachings and um, related to other behaviors that we're trying to find positive alternatives for. Our next poll question is coming on. In your family of origin, were you punished or disciplined? Again, I'll wait a few moments while your responses are coming in. So Karen, it looks like about 65% of our participants were disciplined and 35% were punished. Um, I'd love to hear your definitions of discipline and punishment and how they play into um, behavioral changes. OK, Jennifer. Well, it's interesting because it's possible that how you answered this may be different from how some of the other participants today have answered this. Uh, we haven't yet talked about punishment and discipline. Some people think of them as the same thing, but I, I see them as quite different. If we take a closer look, punishment is really for the parent. Uh, it's a way to vent the parent's anger and get back at her child, perhaps. It often involves yelling, overreacting, sarcasm, or things like spanking. And it really leaves the child and the parent feeling some bad things, feeling shame, 
fear and perhaps remorse or guilt. We've all been there where we've reacted to our child in a way that afterward we feel like, oh no, that was such an overreaction. I really wish I hadn't done that. You, you feel it in your gut. Discipline, on the other hand, is for the child. It's a chance to teach those long-term internal qualities. It's a learning process where we teach our child to connect his or her misbehavior with its impact and to learn alternative behaviors that will be so much more effective for her or him. It's done in a way that's calm and understanding and consistent. And it really feels safe for the child. It brings a sense of structure, safety, and caring, and progress. OK, so when, when we talked about punishment versus discipline, and you answered your question, um, not sure if you were thinking of these differences at the time, but uh, clearly, I think discipline is a way to really um, help your child um, learn some of these internal qualities and get along well as, as he or she grows. With punishment, um, that's a chance for us to really pause and bring our awareness uh, to our own history that we were talking about before. We can look at our own histories and decide, what are some of the things that I would like to continue that maybe I was raised with? And what are some of the things I'd like to change? Typically, we will continue with automatic behaviors when we're feeling stress. So it's pretty common for it to be a pitfall that if you were raised in a, in a punishing atmosphere, um, when you're feeling stressful in a situation when maybe your child is having a tantrum, um, it might be a very automatic trigger um, to respond in a punishing way. And that might be a sign to, to pause and become aware and take the response that feels right. Today we're talking about positive discipline. So where does the positive come in? Our children start from a place of wanting to please us. Sometimes that's easy to forget. But it's more effective to ask for the behavior that we want to see instead of stopping the bad behavior, or what we think of as bad behavior. For instance, instead of saying, don't poke the baby, maybe try, the baby likes it when you touch him gently. And then uh, your child might be able to visualize um, herself as being someone who can touch gently. There are other examples. You might say, um, instead of stop yelling, you might say, I hear you better when you use an indoor voice. And then it helps to follow it up with, oh, nice job using that voice. And we all respond better to encouragement. Um, think to yourself how, how you might have felt at your last job review or an academic review. Um, you know, what motivates you? Is it, is it through encouragement or, um, or criticism? I think we all do better when we feel better. So now we can summarize a bit some of the principles of effective discipline. First of all, it's really crucial, as we talked about before, to be curious about your child's development and behavior. Often we don't pair that with, um, with discipline, but uh, to start with understanding your child uh, and what your expectations for success might be um, according to his stage in development uh, is very important. For instance, uh, for a two-year-old, you might expect that he could come along on one short errand. Um, for someone who's older, uh, perhaps um, it might be more realistic to, to expect that that she could come along on, on a longer errand, or two errands. Present a unified approach with your partner or caregiver. This is crucial. You may have to discuss or even compromise with either your partner or um, other, child's, uh, other of your children's caregivers, such as uh, a nanny or um, a daycare provider. If you, provide, if you present that unified approach, though, that'll make it so much easier to, to set your expectations um, and respond in a similar way. 
uh, children are masters, as you might already know, at finding the weak links and playing people off of each other. Set clear expectations and limits and offer acceptable choices. We'll talk more about this at the next webinar, but basically we want to make it easy for our children to know what to do. Things like, when you put your toys on the shelf, we can go to the playground. Or, the car can't go when there's yelling. You might try saying very clear um, expectations, like, you can stay at the table with us if you use your manners. It helps to um, offer acceptable choices. Uh, if both choices are okay with you, it allows your child to develop a bit of uh, feeling of independence. So my personal favorite is to phrase things like, would you like to brush your teeth now or in 10 minutes? And if both of those are fine with me, then it gives uh, my child a little freedom. Notice your child's efforts and good choices. This one is sometimes easy to forget. Uh, we can use praise, attention, or little rewards like stickers. Uh, to show when we appreciate that the child has made an effort. Things like, you're using a nice voice today. Or, I like it when you listen. We have more time to play. That one kind of combines noticing that your child is behaving a certain way and um, that you, you plan to um, provide more time together. Or, I saw you stay calm when he took your toy. That can go a long way with a child in reinforcing the behavior. On the flip side, if your child has a setback or some sort of behavior that isn't appropriate, show empathy and faith in their abilities. So you could say, it's hard to stay calm in a supermarket, but I bet you'll be able to do it next time and feel proud of yourself. And apologize for your own lapses. This helps to show uh, you know, really to model accountability and how to repair a situation and that it's not, it's not a power trip, but that we're all trying to work on things. So sometimes I've said, um, oh, I'm sorry I yelled at you before. I was uh, feeling very angry and I'm trying to work on staying calm. Today we talked about developmental issues punishment versus discipline, and promoting positive qualities. This, of course, leads to more questions. Next time, we'll learn strategies about how to apply these concepts to our own children, the nuts and bolts of setting up our environment for success, setting limits, and following through consistently. Please send us your questions via the question box on the right side of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can in the time remaining. Karen, we've already gotten in a great question. How do you feel about timeouts? Oh, timeouts. <laughs> There's a, a hot topic. Uh, let's see. Well, it really depends, which may not be the answer most people would like to hear. It can be a complicated issue, though. Um, sometimes timeouts can be used for discipline, but uh, some people find it helpful to use them as really a place to calm down, for, to teach your child that if um, she's feeling very overwhelmed, um, it can be a nice, calm environment with soft things to touch and a blankie or a teddy bear, um, something so that she can learn to notice her own cues eventually and realize, oh, I need to calm down and be able to use uh, tools to, to learn how to do that. Um, parents can also say, I think I'm so frazzled right now, I'm going to take a time out. And I can model that use. Uh, other times, it may be helpful to use a time out uh, if, if there's behavior, maybe an interaction between several children, and it's really important to isolate your child from the others in that, in that uh, instance. So it, it depends. And it also depends on your own philosophy and on your own child. Some children, uh, might be too upset to be in a timeout and feel too abandoned. Other children can use it quite well as a, as a technique for discipline. Karen, that fits right into our, the philosophy of our parent consultation program. We ask parents to almost think of things as a three-legged stool. We ask them to think about the parents' philosophy, their children's 
needs and who they are and where their development is and sort of what the goal uh, is of whatever they're doing. Oh, I like that. I haven't heard that, that image before. I, I think I'll, <laughs> I like that one. Um, we just got another question in. What do you do when a child repeats a bad word that you said? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, obviously the, the easiest way to prevent that is to watch what we say. Um, that's not always possible because we're human. So if, if you do say something and you hear your child repeating it, um, I would suggest to, to be frank with your child and say, you know, I goofed. I said, I said a word that was bad and I wish I hadn't. Um, and now I'm hearing you say it and I wish you wouldn't also. Uh, maybe just be open with your child and and still keep your expectations. So, and maybe say, we'll both work on it. Here's a question. My partner and I are divorced, and we have very different um, philosophies about discipline. So when my child is at my ex-husband's house, he handles things very differently than I do at home. And I think it's very confusing to our child. What What should we do about that? That's an excellent question. It's one that I deal with a lot in my practice with families. Uh, as you know, it's, it's um, helpful to have a consistent framework for responding to behaviors and having a, a, an approach to discipline. Um, so uh, the first thing I would try is to, is to discuss that with your partner and try to come to a common ground and, and say, you know, I know we have our differences but it's really very helpful for our child to know that things are going to be the same at each house. How can we get to that place? Um, if that's not possible, then uh, you know that may be a, a something to address in in more deep discussions um, in a neutral setting. Or there can also be a way to help your child understand the situation. Um, maybe to, to say these are the rules here, there are different rules there. Um, gee, that seems a little funny, but that's how things are. And, you know, what are the rules here? Try to proceed from there and make the best of it. Karen, we have time for one more question. And here's a, something that is a good question because it's sort of in vogue these days, sticker charts. sticker charts. What do you think about them and do they work? <laughs> uh, sticker charts, sometimes they can be very effective. Uh, they tend to be helpful to, especially for young children, to help keep something in mind. So whether it's um, potty training or keeping the toys uh, off of the floor and on the shelves or using an indoor voice, whatever the behavior is, if you keep it um, very clear that it's one behavior you're, you're doing this for, um, it can help keep that behavior in mind for your child over several days maybe. and um, and be able to notice the good behavior if it happens. Uh, and it's surprising how much children just adore stickers. Uh, and they don't need a bigger reward than that often. Um, it, it helps for that type of behavior. It's a bit less effective for creating the internal reasons for a child to uh, want to do something for its intrinsic value. So I'd say it has its place. Thank you, Karen. I'm really excited for your part two, which is our next webinar, Please Save the Date, um, Positive Approaches to Discipline Part Two with Karen and myself again, creating a home environment that encourages success, setting limits, goals, and consequences, and following through. And that webinar will take place on April 23rd at 1230. If anything you've heard today or thought about today has made you think, I might like to meet with a parent consultant at Jewish Family and Children's Services to discuss my particular situation in my home. You can receive that individualized parenting support by contacting Terry Chebet at tchebet at jfcsboston.org or calling 781-693-5669. You can also learn more about our parent consultation program at www.jfcsboston.org backslash parent consultations. We've really enjoyed having you with us today, and we look forward to speaking with you again on April 23rd.